empower believers and to get those to the church or the church age. And so the time between the church age and his return, or the day of the day of the and his return, we ask, what's Jesus doing in the meantime? What's he doing on our behalf? He said, he is our high priest. So he got up there just being idle, but that is his very active on our part, now working from heaven. He's offered himself as a perfect sinless sacrifice. He's presented himself to God on our behalf so that we can be forgiven. But he has become our mediator, which means that he is the one that he that is intervening between two disputing parties. Whether we like it or not, if we don't believe, if we are not believers, we're at war with God. The scriptures are very plain. If you're not for me, you are against me. Now, Jesus, as our mediator, returns to heaven and begins to function as our great high priest, and he mediates this new covenant that has been established in his blood by bringing peace where there was only one separation and violence and war between God and between man. He's also our advocate, which means that he's our lawyer who takes up our case before the Father. And he makes intercession for us, especially when we sin. He's praying for us, even now. So that's what Jesus is doing in heaven until the second time, which was our next sermon. And we said uh, in, the, in that sermon uh, that he gave his disciples a choice and that he also, again, was preparing them For what was going to take place, that's the promise of his return. In the meantime, again, it comes back to this mission that the church is on mission for Christ to preach the gospel in the power of the Spirit until Jesus returns, which is the climax and consummation of the ages, the great hope and the longing of his followers. On that day, the trump of God will sound, the man on the white horse will appear from heaven, his feet will once again stand on this soil. And he will destroy once and for all every vestige of enemy control over his people. And he will reign forever and ever. And a question on that day was Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you loving and looking for his return? And then we sort of change course. So we talked about Jesus and the 40 days and his ascension, what he's doing in heaven as a real high priest. And we talked about his ascension. Then we changed course when we started to talk about the promise of the coming Holy Spirit. In our first message there, I titled Epic of the Spirit. That was one of my favorite ones in the, in the whole lot of them. And we talked about uh, in that sermon how at the beginning of the Bible, in the first two chapters, and in the last two chapters, what we see is God's desire being played out among his people. That is, God is loving, God is living with his people. Now, in the beginning, that fellowship is broken in Genesis chapter 3, and from that point on, God begins to work to restore the relationship that was broken. And in the Old Testament, or the Old Testament, what we see is that God sends his spirit, his very presence, to dwell in and fulfill first the tabernacle, and then the temple so that he can be in the midst of his people by two desires. But his people are so stiff necked and hard hearted that they can't receive what God has for them in his presence. It's like God is never enough. And so he has to judge them. And he carries them into exile. It's actually an um, expression of mercy to save his people. But in that saving of the people, what he has to do is realize now what they want to withdraw his spirit. We see the exile of his spirit depart. Many, many years passed. Over 400 years passed. And Jesus shows up on the scene. And what he does is, in the midst, even though the temple has been destroyed and now rebuilt and is being refurbished and expanded and is impressive. Jesus walks around and he is usurping the function of the temple. In other words, he's doing things that were only supposed to be done at the temple. Walking around as a living expression of the presence of God, empowered for ministry by the Holy 
And so he's doing things like forgiving sins and healing the sick. Things that you see even written about in the New Testament. The fact that anyone in the presence of God is there. And, and we see those things actually happening at the end of the day. And then Jesus believes that he sends his Holy Spirit to fill his people and to initiate the new covenant or the new covenant. And that promise that comes along with that new covenant is that anyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. Will be filled, will be baptized with the Spirit. The Spirit will be given now, not just to rest upon people for a certain period of time, like we saw in the Old Testament, but rather to come and to live inside our bodies. These mobile heads, these tabernacles. And the invitation is that if the Spirit comes, that we should be raised to the means of life, even Christ has been raised by the Spirit, and that we might become. Living expressions of the Spirit of God in the world in which we live, that we might, because God takes us to be our very temple of God, and we are walking around that in the age of the Spirit in the time of Jesus until the end of the time of the age of the Spirit. And then my favorite of all was the beauty of contrast, and that was the Mother's Day message. Said that God has been working with women since the very beginning of image bearing. And it's interesting that that's one of the things that seems to plague women. Some of the pressures that cause the pit on women are image bearing. They struggle with image because of all of the pictures that are out there of what it means to be a picture woman. But God says, Your picture is not my picture. Your picture is. Your, your work is only found in me and in the image that I have given also to you. But all through the Old Testament, God shows how He works with these women in very contrasting ways. All different kinds of women in all different stages of life. And yet God uses them to further His purpose. And then Jesus comes along. And the New Testament gospel writers and the New Testament church come along. And what they do is they simply affirm what God has already been doing with women. He's been working with women just like He has been working with men, but it becomes so much more clear in the New Testament because the promise of the coming of the Spirit is both that men and women will be filled equally with the Spirit, and God begins to do astounding and miraculous things through women in the establishment of the church right alongside men, and for 2,000 years of church history, that has been neglected. But a plain sense reading of the New Testament says, that is not so. God uses the heart that would be submitted. Because the promise is, here, we see the men in the And we talked about the work of the Spirit in our next sermon, and we said, just as a reminder, that the Spirit is a real life person with fear and with intellect, and that he is co equal with God, and that makes him God himself as the third person of the Trinity. And that you see him from beginning to end, exercising his power in creation, taking what is void and formless and dark, and filling up all of those empty places, turning on the light and giving life in the picture of the creation. And we came to the conclusion that just like he did in creation, he wants to do in us as God's new creation. Filling up our lives, filling up all the void places, all the empty places, all the dark places. To take up hold. And we talked about then that it wasn't just a one time thing that we are being filled with His Spirit. As a matter of fact, we talked about that commandment, the Spirit, which was written to a community who were to allow this to happen in an ongoing way. So it's not just one person filling, it is day by day. Filling, much like we would fill a balloon with it. The balloon is full of air, no matter how large it is, on the board and so on. We're filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit continues to be filled 
with the Spirit in ever increasing measure. And the invitation is that we should expect that God would show if we will only create a space in our hearts for Him to do that. He doesn't trust us to do it. And then on a Sunday night, we talked about sins of the Holy Spirit. And we asked the question because the Holy Spirit is to be the person, and because He lives inside of us and we're in close relationship with Him, could it be possible for us to sin against the Spirit? And the answer, of course, is yes. And we looked at several different ways that we can sin against the Spirit. We can resist Him by rejecting His gracious attempts to win our hearts to Jesus. We can quench the Spirit by suppressing the working of the Spirit in our individual lives or in the life of the church, much like we would suppress the fire to put it out. We can grieve the Holy Spirit by living like sinners, even though we're already saved. And uh, we certainly don't want to insult the Spirit with His um, greatly and willfully sinning against Him, because what that is is, I mean, that's a very, very dangerous place to be to insult the Spirit. It is a sign that we are turning away from our life of faith and what is influenced sin in the reality of the gospel. Where we want that faith, now we want that faith into our worship. And, and then, of course, we talked about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, also known as the unforgivable or unpardonable sin. And we said that that was a conscious repudiation of the fact that God is at work in Jesus, accomplishing His plan of salvation through the power of the Spirit, to the point of attributing the work of the Spirit to the work of Satan, making saving faith impossible because forgiveness is rejected, scoffed at, and scorned. But that was all placed within the context. Jesus healing and religious leaders saying that he was not healing in the power of the Spirit, but rather in the power of Satan himself. That's how hard their heart was. And when your heart is that hard, the reason the sin is unforgivable, it's unforgivable, is not because God is not willing to forgive you, it's that you are in unbelief, unwilling to ask. For forgiveness because you don't think that you need it. Therefore, it's unforgivable. You can live our entire life that way. You can even die that way. And that's the end of it. If you're worried, if you've done this, sin against the Spirit, then you have it. Because if you're thinking about it, worried about it, it means that you're still looking with you to bring you to a place of forgiveness. And then he jumps over to a real happy subject, the fruit of the Spirit, over against the selfish vices in the book of Galatians that Paul mentions that flow out of a sinful heart and produce guilt and bondage before the law of God. Because that's what sin does. It produces guilt and bondage. You think that you're free, but in actuality, you're only creating a prison for yourself. That's earthly sin. But God wants to set you free, and that's the message of the book of Galatians. Paul says, over against all that sin does, now, this is the overflow of the Spirit-filled heart. This is how Christians who are full of the Spirit should be displaying that very fact that God lives inside of them. They should be showing forth the very produce, the fruit of the Spirit, which is... Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, tenderness, and self-control. And then he says, against such things, there is no law. Because now the Spirit is inside of us, making it a joy to obey the law, and not simply an argument. Something that was promised in the Old Testament. Remember through the prophets, God said, one day say, I'm going to replace your heart of stone where those commandments are written with a fleshy heart. A heart of spirit. We're no longer going to be bound by the law of prophecy, but rather you will be free in the spirit 
to your flesh people that you will be to your And when you find yourself in that place, you will be able to give it the truth of the Spirit. We're not out of time in the process. Yes, God does the work. When we become believers, you plant those things in us, but then we are to prove away all that sin junk in our life, and then we are to nourish all the spirit stuff more and more so that the fruit continues to grow in our life. And I just got us to a discussion on 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and the gift of the Spirit. And if you show me to initiate that conversation, the gift of the Spirit, part one, and part two. In part one, we, we open the door here at Pentecost to experience the work of the Spirit. And um, we did it, hopefully, uh, and for some people, it will be in a holy way. And we clarify the work of the, of the gifts of the Spirit. What, what are they for? And we said, if they, so that members of the body may serve each other and serve the world lovingly to the name of Jesus more fully. And we listed what those gifts were, especially the supernatural ones, because it seems like that's what people have the most trouble with. Not like it's um, not a miracle that you would be saved. <laughs> like that's a supernatural gift in the first place, and we want to accept that. But what about all of the other things that come along with it? Things like words of wisdom, words of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, power to transform, miracles, prophecy, discernment, speaking in tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. All of these things that were in practice in, practice in the churches in the New Testament time frame, and by the way, we're still in the New Testament time frame, we're still in the age of the Spirit, so we should still be expecting those things to happen when we open the door for God to step in and to begin to do those kinds of things among us. And then I expanded that list in the second sermon on that to about 22 from the, the most spectacular or supernatural gift, which may be, I don't know, working of miracles or whatever it is that you may say, all the way down to gifts of service or help. It's the mundane. From the spectacular to the mundane, the New Testament lists about 22 different gifts. By the way, those gifts are not just supernatural. They are mundane, but then they also involve individual gifts to the church. Uh, in another kind of capacity to oversee the church, like pastors and teachers and prophets and apostles. And we put all of that into context and we talk about what that meant. And we also established the fact, let me just mention that nowhere in Scripture is it ever indicated that the gifts of the Spirit are seen. But rather, I think it follows the claim of Scripture that the gift is still in operation being given to the church at Pentecost until Jesus returns. That's how it was initiated, and that is how it will continue. The effort is really of the Spirit, that God gave the Spirit to the early church so that we could be gifted within the church to build one another up, to love one another one another in a greater way, and to love the world in a greater way, then why would we think that it would be with us? And basically, there's one thing that it's you from 1 Corinthians 14. I didn't know that Paul's discussion on that. And it talks about where there are some of these gifts that are seen. And, um, and they'll see when that which is perfect comes. And when we see that perfect come, we'll see that perfect face-to-face, that's relational language. The argument is that when the scripture was finished and put together, we didn't need the gift anymore. But when the scripture mentions when Paul says face-to-face, he isn't finished that. He, in particular, makes sure that he writes face-to-face. When we see that was just perfect face-to-face, that is a relational term that goes all the way back to the Old Testament. Paul is talking about a personal relationship with a very real, a very present, a very personal God in the form of Jesus Christ. So in other words, we won't need the gift when Jesus comes back, but until then, they're in operation. Stop closing the door. 
but allow the door to be open and then allow God to step in to our worship services and into our personal lives and begin to use us in those gifts because if we do that, we will indeed be built up. You will have much greater satisfaction in your worship experience and in your relationship with God. But much more than that, the body will be edified and Jesus will be glorified. But there's no reason for us to think that that's a thing. But we do have obligations and responsibilities. And that's, that's what I want to talk about today. But before I do, I've got to talk about the day of Pentecost because that's one of those things. Right? And it was very unusual because we, we started out in Acts 1, right? We went through all that. We jumped back to Acts chapter 2 and talked about the day of Pentecost. And here's what's really cool about this, and we don't think about this at all. If you go back to Acts chapter 2 and read about the day of Pentecost, we're actually reading about things that happened at the beginning of all of this, but that weren't recorded until after most of all of these things happened. Like Paul writes in Galatians, he filled with the Spirit. He wrote that before Acts chapter 2 was written in the day of Pentecost. When Paul writes in Acts chapter 12 and Acts chapter 14, which we're going to look at in a minute, about the gifts of the Spirit and how they are to operate, he wrote those things before we wrote the word in the book of Acts in Acts chapter 2 about the day of Pentecost. So, and have you ever thought of that before? So, the new church, the early church, they're trying to figure all of this out even before those events are inspired and written down by God to Luke about how the church was done. They're still trying to figure it out, which should be great news for us because we hey, when God begins to move, you know, what we try to do is we try to figure it out. God, I think, sometimes says, hey, just like you did the other church, stop trying to figure it out. Just accept what I'm doing in the midst. Maybe that's the message for today. Stop trying to figure it out. And allow God to work in the midst. On the day of Pentecost, it us is in a whole new day, a whole new baptism, a whole new filling. The age of the Spirit has come. I'm in the middle of this present age, and things began to happen like Jewish people thought were going to happen at the end of days. Like, the, like miracles and, and all of these wonderful signs were happening right in the middle of everything, and then God pours out His Spirit, and everybody who's in town for the festival, they're amazed, and here comes the disciples, and they're speaking in other tongues, and it happens to be on that occasion that it's actually earthly languages. And all of the people that are there hear the disciples. The disciples aren't preaching to them. The disciples are worshiping God. Go back and read it. They're telling of the glories of God because that's what the gifts do as well. They're a manifestation of the glory of God in our midst. And when we close the door, I wonder if we don't read the Spirit. I do And that's something that we don't want to do. All that we can on the day of Pentecost. The invitation on that day was that we do like the early disciples and we wait and we accept the spirit of the Holy Spirit. And then last week we talked about Father's Day and the end of the night. So we're almost home from vacation, turned down our screen. Last week we were reminded that men with the help of the Spirit are to be like their Father in heaven. He is honorable, acceptable, dependable, and then merciful. And if that's possible, if we would only remember, we trust that if we would, that would go up on the way to God. That's what we trust. Help us. And now we turn into our driveway. We hit the button for the glass door. And I want to look this morning the rest of the season, just a few minutes in this morning. Acts chapter 14. Verse 20. And then by the end of the day, I want to answer three questions. So this is my objective today. I want to look at what the text says. I want to look at what it means. And then I want to look at what it means to us. I'll answer that in part this morning, uh, three of these, and then 
tonight, maybe I'll get into more graphic details. Everything that I said today, I took with 20 minutes to be like 13, 14 seconds. I'll engage so much more to the people. But I just wanted to remind you that all of this is coming to bear on the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Right? And as new as it was. At times it had to be the hope that we lay down. So that when the Spirit did manifest himself through the individual in the church, so that it would be done in a way that would be pleasing to God. And God has given us particular examples in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 because of a crazy, crazy, but super blessed church that could and if you look at what Paul writes in chapter 14, you can look at what it says and what it means and then what it means to us as well. And the very first thing that Paul begins with is a preference to prophecy. The early Christians at the rest were fascinated with the newfound spiritual gifts that were from God. I mean, in the Greek pagan religions, it was nothing for them to be written to a frenzy. So they bring that into church and they think the crazier, the wackier that it gets, the better the church service is. I know. I know. Anybody ever been to a Pentecostal church like that? Yeah. Right? Right? And they think, oh, look how spiritual we are. That's the Corinthian church. Nothing gets accomplished, but they have a good service. And they're coming together and they're doing this all over the city of Korea in these little house churches about this size. They're only doing what they need to. They're carrying in from the world what is already familiar to them. And they're applying the gifts of the Spirit in ways that the world applies. The work of the devil. Who do you think is in charge of the pagan cult in the Greek village? This is God's stuff. Of course, God is in charge of everything, but I'll tell you who appears to be running the show. It's the demon. And Paul says so in other places. The idols that they are worshiping are more than wood and stone, but behind them there is a power, and that power is that demonic. And now they're bringing that into the church, and Paul says, This has got to stop. And I want you to place a preference now because of your practice on prophecy. So, Paul takes up a lot of space for Corinthians 12 to talk about gifts, for Corinthians 13 to talk about love, which is the supreme motivation behind the gifts. Paul says, hey, listen, desire the greater gift. Here's the most excellent way that you can express them, that's in love. And then he weighs the merits of two gifts that the church seems to be struggling with the most. They overvalued one, that would be tongues, and they undervalued the other, and that would be prophecy. And so Paul writes as a corrective measure. You have to understand that's what this is all about. It's guidelines that can be applied to the worship service, and Paul is writing to a specific situation. Which means that the situation is such that a gift can be expanded to include other types of gifts and things of that nature. It just so happens that this church is struggling with prophecy in tongues. Actually, they're just a bunch of tongue talkers and they can't seem to shut up. And it's causing chaos and confusion within the church and nobody is getting built up. So Paul has the right to correct and instruct them. And he begins this chapter by looking at prophecy and tongues and he contrasts them in order to begin to restore the health that is lost. And so here you get a little window into what's happening in this church, right, as you read the text. So he's looking back at what he's already said. And, and now bringing that forward, he's saying, follow the way of God and eagerly desire the gift of the Spirit especially Prophecy, which is divinely inspired, intelligible speech that is given by the Spirit to instruct and to strengthen others. 
not the same necessarily as necessarily as preaching here, but rather it's when God moves on your heart within the context of the local gathering, the church service, with a word of prophecy, be sure to show that so that the church can be built up. For anyone who here is such a contrast, for anyone who speaks with a tongue that's an unknown, unintelligible, Holy Spirit in a language does not speak to people but to God. So, there's a clear classification of tongues. You can pray in tongues. That's what he's saying here. Indeed, no one understands them. And, and it's, 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 this is in the context of the church. Okay? Anyone who speaks in a tongue, an unknown, unintelligible language, they're speaking to God, they're praying to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit, and the Spirit is the source. It's all right, he says so. Verse 3, but the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. For for anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but the one who prophesies edifies, edifies the church. In other words, when you come to church, all you're doing is building up yourself. In an undue fashion, by putting too much emphasis and too much expression on the speaking in tongues. Verse 5, then, Paul is just a corrective measure. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but, which also indicates that maybe everyone is on it, but I would rather that you prophesy. And by the way, notice, and I'll mention it later, this is a blanket statement for everyone who comes to church. Because there are church services, when they got together, everybody participates in some form or fashion according to how the Spirit has gifted them. So, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues for sure, but I don't believe you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. So what do you mean by that? Greater in value in a church service, that's it. Not that there are more spiritual things. But rather, it gives up more value in the church service to offer words that people can understand. Unless someone interprets so that the church may be able to In other words, and maybe here's another category of tongues, a message in tongues given for the whole church. Keep your mouth shut unless there's an interpreter present, because it would be absolutely no good. Oh, you'll be sure about it, but nobody else will get anything about it. And that's what Paul is fighting for. That's what Paul is correcting. He says, there's a problem with tongues, and they're not clear to everyone involved. So he writes in, in verse 6, Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you, and I'm speaking tongues, what good will it be to you unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? In other words, I'll say to the church, hey, we need clear communication in the church. So back off the other stuff, focus on what's clear in the church. And then you give three analogies, three metaphors, to help and grasp what he's saying. Because apparently, it's a different mess in the church. So he says, this one, even in the case of lifeless things, which I think is a little bit of a fascinating Class. Even in the case of lifeless things, but here's nothing special. Even in the case of lifeless things that make sound, musical instruments, such as a pipe or a heart, how will anyone know what the tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? We don't know the song unless you put the notes in the right order and play them at the right time. And all this tongue talking is doing nothing. We don't even know the song you're trying to sing. Like a musician would be trying, I mean, that would be awful, wouldn't it? If they got up here and everybody was playing something different. Believe me, I heard that happen. It is not something. Paul's saying, that's what it sounds like in the church. It sounds like a bunch of music, and half the people are out of tune anyway. And the fact that it's not that they're out of tune, it's that they don't even know that they're out of tune. And they're just thinking they're all this stuff. I don't know if I said that for me, 
Jews are for everybody. That's why I was going to And then, after that, he likens it to trumpets that sound a clear call to get the people ready for battle. So, all the sun talking is like a bunch of jumbled up music. It's like an unclear call to battle. Somebody blows the trumpet. If it's muffled, if it's unclear, if the notes are played wrongly, then how will the soldiers know what to do? Should they advance? Should they retreat? Ultimately, what would end up would be in battle that they would die, not knowing what to do. And if all of this continues, I think Paul would say, by way of illustration, that if you don't stop it, you're simply going to die. You're going to consume the church upon yourself so much so that it's going to die. Because nobody knows what's going on. So he warns against that. And then in verse 10, he talks about language. So there's the message that undoubtedly there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me, for well, so it is with you. Since you are ego for the gift of the Spirit, how do you tell someone that they are? Language is a difficult purpose to be able to communicate. Tongues, you're communicating with God. It's not fine to you, but it's not helping anyone else unless they're in the purpose. So think before they can quit using the language that you can use just to communicate. And then he provides a solution with uninterpreted tongues. Verse 13, for this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. So it's up to the person, first of all, if you're going to do this, pray that you can interpret so that it will be a benefit for all. And then Paul illustrates the point here with him at his own self. He says this in verse 14, For if I pray in the tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So, what shall I do? I will pray with the Spirit, but I will also pray with understanding. So, you see the balance here. Paul says, yes, I can pray in the Spirit. But if I do so, it's not really benefiting my mental faculties. It's not like it's a mindless thing. But I'm not benefiting with more knowledge. I'm simply relating to God, and I'm getting edified by it, sure. But I don't stop there. I also pray with understanding so that I can also be built up in my, my relationship with God in a cognitive way, in a way that resonates with my mind. So, isn't that what we say and do so often in the church? Um, uh, we, we talk about, you know, I, I know it's here, but I don't know it's here. And we all kind of know what that means. Um, but that's kind of what Paul says. Listen, you can have it here, but it doesn't mean as much if you don't have it here, too. So, Paul says, listen, you can have it both ways. You can have the best of both worlds. That's what I'm trying to do, so that I can not only be built up in my spirit, but also in my understanding. Because that's what he wants for them. But to think otherwise, when you are praising God in the spirit, how can someone else who is now put in the position of an inquirer, so the rest of it, isn't it? And I do, Jesus, the word inquirer, to say, amen, to his own feelings, since they don't know what you're saying. So here Paul introduces the fact that we should expect in our churches people who are coming just to inquire about the Lord. And people obviously are coming to church to inquire. So Paul addresses a very real issue and says, listen, if somebody comes in and they're seeking the Lord, they're inquiring about what this whole Christianity is all about, and all you guys are doing is talking in tongues, what good is it going to do them? They can't even say amen because you don't know what you're saying. And yet you cause confusion. Why are you doing this? Please, Paul says, stop. There's a place for both of them. Don't overemphasize one, but use good judgment. So that other people can be added to the place. We're 17, you're getting things thrown up, but no one else is better. Oh, there's the key. Paul oh, said, so you're being selfish. You're looking all spiritual, but in reality, you know what's up, 
for being selfish, and no one else is being benefited. And here you have in mind, not just the church, but also anybody that would come and inquire about the Lord. You are directly casting a dark shadow on the name of Jesus within the scenes of spiritual gifts and the way that they are. And so then Paul says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of us. So Paul is an avid tongue talker. But out of consideration for others, he's saying, I'm willing to leave that at home. Have you ever heard that before? I said, listen, yeah, I speak in tongues more than all of you, but it doesn't mean anything. I'm willing to leave that at home. And the reason I know that that's what the reference is to because it's because of verse 19. It's at the end of church. As opposed to at home. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. 10,000 in Greek is the largest number that there is. Oh, you can do it all day long. Doesn't mean anything in the context of the church service unless someone is there to tell everyone else. Thanks for your stuff. Also, let's say five words and go home. If that's the way that you can do it, because you do more good. That one. And then he launches into a hard saying. And I'm running out of time, so we're probably going to get it. Verse 25, and then we'll come back to the church service tonight. And so this, rather than sisters, God is in God's church. They were trying to impress God. And anyone else that might come in, selfishly, at the expense of others. So he says, brothers and sisters, God is in life children. In regard to evil, be infants. In other words, be innocent in this whole matter of anything evil. Be innocent of wrongdoing. Don't fall into this trap that, in your thinking, be adult. But you have, within your ability, to control what the Spirit is doing. These gifts are subject to you as you are being, so control the gifts of the Spirit that God has given you. Here's the whole thing. Verse 21. In the law, it is written, with other times, and through the lips of him, which I will speak to the speech, but even then, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues, then, are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is not for unbelievers, but for believers. I mean, what in the world is Paul talking about there? Paul talks back to an Old Testament reference in the book of Deuteronomy and more specifically Isaiah, and he's explaining what spiritual maturity looks like from that vantage point in corporate worship. And so he cites these two Old Testament passages that by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to these people, and even so, they will not listen to me. And so the point of this Old Testament citation is that Israel wouldn't even listen to the prophets who spoke their own language, let alone foreigners who came along and took the text. So what makes you think? And, and, and the foreigners were speaking the language that they didn't understand. So what makes you think that if you're speaking in tongues, the people are going to understand and turn to me? I mean, the voice of the prophets was calling, they were calling people back to God. Paul is saying, listen, you're talking in tongues. It's like a foreign language like in the Old Testament. I mean, the people didn't even listen when it was spoken in their language. Why do you think they're going to listen? If you're talking a language, they don't know. They think they're going to impress somebody by speaking in tongues. But Paul says, no, you got it all wrong. Let me give you an example from the Old Testament. So the sign of tongues is really for the believer. That's what's in Paul's mind. Prophecy is for the unbelievers. So it's just the opposite of what we think. I probably didn't make that clear. In the Old Testament, the people wouldn't know that they didn't want to send their own life. So God sent his peace for the foreign language to judge them. And what made them think that they could 
stand and listen to them. They did it. All about drawing on that whole picture and trying to listen. You have to put so much emphasis on time thinking that you're going to listen to people don't even know what you're saying. Remember how they were in the Old Testament? It was absolutely no good. The people wouldn't listen to my clear voice and they wouldn't listen to a voice that came in the I think what's important in here is the fact that they have put way too much emphasis on time thinking that it's going to bring somebody to the world. That's the main thing. Prophecy is what's going on here at the time. It's speaking plainly to the world about the things that are going on in the world. It's not all of this spiritual stuff. As simple as the spirit in this passage and some small part of the passage is, it's a sign. So the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues. Then inquirers or any way to come in. And they will not say that you are out of your mind. So listen, if everybody expressing all of these gifts, this is what's going to happen. They're going to come to the church and they're going to say, this is out of your mind. I don't know what this is. This is crazy. We have no reason to do this. I see absolutely no value in them doing this. These people are out of their mind. It comes with a sign. The believers that unbelievers prophesy, however, the not for unbelievers, but for believers, verse 23. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, and inquirers or unbelievers come in, who may not say you're out of your mind? But, verse 24, if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in, while everyone's prophesying, they will be convicted. Listen, this is what could happen in church church, okay? When the word of God is spoken clearly. They will be convicted of sin by the Spirit, and they will be brought under judgment by all. In other words, they'll be called to repent. And it's in their life by the church. It's pretty intimidating, isn't it? An inquirer or an unbeliever comes in. They're touched by the Spirit, by prophesying, by the preaching, teaching of the Word. They're kept in the heart. They're called into question. They're bad behavior. What do they do this? Then they confess their sins so that they can be forgiven and accepted into the community. Why? Because the secrets of their heart have been laid bare. In other words, they make a, a public confession. I am a sinner. I need to be forgiven. And then what do they do? They fall down and they worship God in vain. Not they must be out of their mind, but rather God is really among you. You see what's happening here. You see they've caused all kinds of problems in the church because they're misusing these two particular gifts. They're putting so much emphasis on one. And we see that happen in the churches today. There's so much emphasis on one thing that another part of the church is drawing up. Not just with prophesying, speaking in tongues, but with church creeds. This is how we do things over here. Oh, we don't do things like that. No, we do things different over here. Hey, that's good and well, but if you're harming people, stop it. That's just the church creed. This is the word of God. Then listen, I have gifted my church. Now, use the gift in ways in ways that will benefit both believers and unbelievers. And all your gibber jabbering around for speaking in tongues is not doing anyone any good at all. It's not helping the church and it's not helping unbelievers. So please, stop it. Seek to prophesy. Seek to encourage the whole body. So that, just in case, an inquirer or an unbeliever should be in your presence. They would hear what is being said. The Spirit would speak to their heart. They would recognize their sin. They would confess it to the congregation. The congregation would embrace them, knowing that they have been forgiven as well. The people who have come in now would fall on their face, begin to praise God, and they would confess. Not your crazy in there, but rather God is among you. And because I've been there, now I can be transformed. By the, by the very Spirit of God because the Word has come to me in a very clear fashion. And from that point then, Paul launches into the rest of the chapter 
And he says, this is how you practice order. And I'm out of time. Let me just talk to you about one more talk tonight. He regulates the use of tongues. He regulates them, the use of prophecy. In verses 26, all the way through 33. And then he comes to a very strange prohibition. I just want to read this to entice your curiosity so that you will come back tonight. I am not going to tell you what this means today. Women who remain silent in the churches. Is that me? They are not allowed to speak by much of the submission. As the law says, if they want to inquire about something, they should ask their husbands at home. For it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. So if you want to know what that is, come back tonight. And we'll call Andrew chapter simply by laying the smack down on them. As only Paul can do. So I really am desirous that you come back tonight and unpack this a little bit. Right. So much information. I told you way too much to cover. It's no good. God is different. We can't expect him to do this. This gift, God has allowed to his property to be submitted to our own will. He says, I give you these gifts, not because they're so much good. I give you these gifts so so that you can benefit other people. Stop thinking so much about yourself. But when you're using this, and when you're thinking about yourself, which becomes very important, at least for me, when you're using this gift in a different way, God will say to you, I think it's because you're hurting the body, and 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 you're hurting the body. All for the sake of your little itty bitty spirituality and the good show in the church. And women, I'm not suffering over this. But you try to come back to find out what they thought about the same way. So tonight we'll also talk about rules and how we evaluate. We shift the things to service, things that we look for. And it's not biblically, it's supposed to be done. It's not so often, it's not done in the church. And then at the end, we're going to take a little time to wait and pray for that. And in this time, it's a good time, whether it's tonight or next week, it's a good time. We're impressing all of this in God. I'm just giving you the information. I'm just a dispensary of the information right now. So let's see what God does. We can give it to you. So, Lord, we have time for this morning's session. I pray that. Um,
all about you It's all about you, Jesus It's all about you It's all about you It's all about you, Jesus. 